Hi, uh, greeting from Hong Kong. I first of all would like to thank IESF for giving me this very precious opportunity to present my presentation, the, the research here. The title of my presentation is Sustainable Ecosystem Development in Eastport Higher Education. My name is Pei Chi Chong and I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So here you'll be able to see three area of the uh, content that I'll be presenting in my talk today. Um, I first of all would like to uh, introduce a bit of some of the research background for my talk the, and then to explain a little bit about why I'm initiating it with my focus, research focus in this area. I come from the discipline of uh, humanity. So a lot of time I focus on my research about studying the meaning of esports culture and also the contribution that this particular culture can be linked to a particular kind of uh, public policy. So what I'm hoping today is to share my research point of view and then hopefully I'll be able to invite, I would like to invite conversation with many of the talented people here who are concerned about esports uh, industry development. So the second part of my research is about my the sharing of some of the observation that I found in the past few years after talking to uh, people in the industry in Korea. Then at the end of my research, I would like to extend my concern into some of the thought that I have, um, particularly in uh, eSport higher education. So here you'll be able to see some of the picture that I took during the few years when I conduct my research. Um, the larger project of this uh, research is about to understanding the ecosystem. Esport is this ecosystem in East Asia. Um, particularly uh, what I'm focusing on today is based upon some observation of an article and an article that I had written on the eco, uh, Esport eco ecosystem in South Korea. So uh, I received this, uh, um, <clears throat> I received a, a research grant funding from the government, um, Hong Kong government in 2017. So I started my visit, research visit, field visit to Seoul uh, at that time. So uh, that, I made my first trip to Seoul and talked to many people um, in the field. And then at that time I was uh, starting from fresh to try to understand what has been um, the type of interesting industry dynamic that has triggered um, the esports culture, growing esports culture in the region. So uh, I want to know a bit about the most developed esports industry field in the world in South Korea. And uh, I still remember I visited the IESF office in Seoul. And then it was really amazing to see how the organization has transformed from that time till now. So here are some of the pictures of the places that I visit, and then it shows some kind of, um, you know, uh, connection that I have with, by visiting too many different places here. All right, so uh, I, based upon my research, I actually uh, published a, 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 a book, an edited book, co-edited with, uh, with another professor in, uh, in Boston on a book called Media Technology for Work and Play in East Asia. So what I'm presenting today is actually one of the chapter uh, from the book that I edited. And the book was published in May 2021. So this book actually provides a critical um, an, a, a entry to have developed some kind of critical perspective to observe some of the emerging techno sphere, cultural sphere, uh, in North East, East Asia. And then what I'm presenting today is actually one of the core area that I find very intriguing to kind of uh, spotlight the, the things, um, the kind of uh, emerging techno-culture dynamic that happened in the region. So in the book, I, we sort of developed uh, the book in two, three categories. So some of the chapter talk about gender, some of the chapter talk about governance, and some of the chapter talk about labor. And what I'm offering today is actually to provide a kind of labor-centric perspective to understand um, um, the esports uh, industry in South Korea. 
So in my chapter of uh, South Korean esports, I mainly want to look for a particular kind of uh, labor change, the new labor definition in the area of esports by including the concept of uh, player power. So, um, so I'm trying to find the meaning of labor power in the context of competitive play. A lot of time people in the discipline of uh, media study and also game study are very focusing on the, um, the, the observation of the industry from the labor perspective. So I'm hoping that with the chapter that will be able to provide a certain kind of alternative meaning to contextualize the society, especially in East Asian societies, very interesting conception on playing. Um, you know, I'm playing playing game for long term, long hours, and then some kind of stereotype to talk about playing game to be a form of uh, unproductive play, um, especially when it's in the addiction and also um, a context that students are dropping out from school. So my question here in the uh, in the uh, in the chapter is to talk about uh, how players. You know, especially esport player has been producing some kind of uh, interesting culture that show us the the power of restructuring the relationship. You know, with different Asians that are contributing to the dynamic of the industry in digital gaming, especially in East Asia. And also, I'm also talking about. Uh, I'm also hoping to find out the political and economic context of South Korea's esports industry. And uh, and also the particularly finding out the contribution for nonprofit organizations such as uh, KSPA and also IESF in advancing player awareness both locally and globally. Uh, I'm also hoping to find out the amateur uh, esports with my focus on the to see how they are becoming part of this uh, labor system in esports. So basically, I want to talk about player power as an academic point of view to study the larger debate in social science tradition regarding digital labor condition. So um, what I'm finding is that actually I'm trying to argue, what I'm trying to argue, argue trying to argue is that actually play has become an inter interesting area which, um, that blur the boundary between professional and amateur player. So a lot of time we're looking at the, the passion that's being developed by eSport player uh, or eSport gamer, the, the will for play, playing to strike, right? So this kind of um, uh, intention for play to thrive despite challenges that the eSport community face from the public institution worldwide, especially, you know, when we talk about the negative impact of game addiction. Um, my analysis um, that I will be presenting later is based upon the kind of, cont it will be context contextualized as voices that are heard within the larger society structure to highlight a certain kind of dilemma that I'm observing um, uh, from Eastport player. A lot of time when they are in the process of developing their career, what are the kind of social uh, circumstances that um, has been produced, that were pro uh, produced, and then what will be the kind of uh, critical moment that we should be take into consideration when we talk, try to understand things that happen in the area with uh, perspective intention for creating more diversity and also public welfare in eSport governance. So here I would like to talk a bit about the kind of research framework that I want to bring in for talking about the labor-centric perspective. So a lot of time we're seeing, um, the, especially in game study, we're seeing a lot of discussion that talks about the transformation for play to work. So um, originally when we talk about play, play is a lot of time people play, play is an a, is a activity that people look for, for pleasure. But when we are looking at work condition, a lot of time people try to find um, their productive uh, t 
talent for a satisfaction for, for to fulfill a certain meaning of their life. So a very interestingly, professional player start from leisure that I observe, and then then because of some um, passion and also some skill that they ab ab obtain in the process, that a uh, player originally were just playing for for um, leisure, but then later they become the playing for professional work. So we're seeing this um, um, this very interesting um, transition from the position of play to the position of work. So um, especially for eSport player in the very competitive play, a lot of time we're also seeing skills that are being developed for a celebrity player that um, they are receiving a lot of uh, attention from audiences through um, uh, by watching all the tournament uh, videos on streaming platform. So a lot of time when we look at um, the transition to into to enter this work area, what we should be um, more focusing on or paying more attention is is this possibility of uh, when players are becoming to consider their play as a form of a professional work production, then what is the possibility uh, si possible situation that we are observing to be representing a re reflecting a form of exploitation? especially within the context of cooperation in relation to gamers, right? So uh, adding competition, eSports, the meaning of play change. And uh, miraculously, when we see eSports player start to add competition and high power performance into their form of playing their, 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 uh, in their competition. So within this process, transformation process, we probably should be uh, Look, asking the question about inequality, at what perspective inequality happens, and especially if we want to develop a sustainable ecosystem, then they, that may be certain area that we should be paying attention to. So employment dimension of work, um, there can be one, one aspect to be glamorous, but then there can also be another aspect that players are having precarious working conditions. So here, this is the sort of uh, 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 dilemma that we are observing when the transition change from play to work. Um, to the reskilling process, the player are able to have much more higher capability for social engaging, social interaction from machine between, um, be, uh, uh, between human and machine. Um, does this kind of reskill uh, obtaining the new skill, providing a better world for this player. So here, this is the observation that I found in particular in the ecosystem that's been developed in South Korea. Um, I am particularly look into, looking into this non-cooperation area because I think these are more interesting, uh, more important when we want to see how uh, inequality can be supported with resolution in this dimension. So CASEBOT and also IESF are the two very important uh, nonprofit organizations that's uh, most of the time associated with the support from the government um, that um, they contribute to the development of the industry. So this, uh, two industry, these two organizations show a very particular kind of player-led innovation ecosystem that's very unique in the East Asian context and also in uh, around the world as well. So the, the efforts, a lot of uh, contribution and also a lot of work that uh, the two institutions have done actually contribute to uh, the country to becoming the leader of the esports field in the region. So we can see um, some of the work done by the two institutions, especially about you know, creating a kind of standardization for creating a fair play environment to contribute with uh, the program to support player qualification, recognition, to enforce standard, and also to encourage fair competition, both uh, locally and also internationally. 
So this is the uh, uh, the kind of fair environment that we see that the two inst uh, institutions have contributed to. And what I find uh, particularly interesting is in a, a lot of uh, players that I um, interview with, um, there's a very interesting things that happens uh, that I find maybe that that's also one of the reasons that's contributing to the sustainability for the industry development. So some of the, um, these are the emerging, some of the most of the player that I uh, interview with, they want to become professional player. But since this is such a competitive uh, industry, competitive field, then not many of them were able to succeed, right? So uh, automatically there was this uh, interesting um, develop development that uh, people who uh, proceed halfway in their professional career. When they decide that they are not going to further to pursue, they voluntarily decide to stay and then try to create their own business. So the, 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 I'm observing new kind of emerging professional area for thinking about the meaning of uh, sustainable development. Um, there's a uh, high player, high level player that uh, went into creating all kind of industry value chain that I'm serving with all kind of uh, business. So I'm also seeing the expansion of uh, the professional uh, eSport to into an amateur and also a, a semi-amateur level. Um, you will be able to see from the, uh, the chart here that some of the uh, amateur player or semi-professional, when they decide they are going to retire, they became farm manager, they become shopcaster, and also become game channel streamer or data analyst, all kind of uh, uh, work that is based on the, the passion of uh, with the uh, eSport uh, field. And I think this is a very, this shows a very interesting um, and also important um, aspect when we are talking about satisfaction that a person can receive from work and also the kind of happiness they will be able to, uh, people will be able to find out from work when they are able to uh, initiate a particular kind of self-driven motivation to decide what they are going to do in their career. So this is the kind of uh, new kind of labor condition that um, that is uh, happening, but then uh, I would like to um, bring that into the current framework um, that comes from the corporation pers perspective. Are uh, those players who quit halfway in their professional process, um, journey? Are those the responsibility of the corporation to think about how they will be able to transit in the process? All right. So here, um, I also want to share some interesting cases. Um, I find that there are five area that uh, I find people particularly um, find it passionate to uh, develop in their career into. So for example, in business category, in education category, in media, in regulation, and also in emerging talent. So here with uh, some of the people who fall into the uh, category A, um, I find this uh, strong passion from the people that I talk to that they're considering their opportunity to create a particular kind of culture of business uh, for esports. So this is very few when we talk about cultural business um, and then the creative, you know, uh, effective um, labor production um, skill. Right. So um, the team manager and also peer entrepreneur are the particular kind of uh, talent that I find that they transform their passion into a particular kind of creative entrepreneurship. And um, the second category is for the education. Um, some of the talent became the professor. So we are now also seeing a lot of expertise being applied and transferred. Transfer, transfer into the um, the the, the uh, higher education level. So we are seeing um, the uh, many department and also many uh, 
university in South Korea started to develop this uh, esports department. It is because of this uh, rich experience and also skill that uh, the semi-professional player develop in their process, uh, in their professional journey when they're when in play, that they lead, they'll be capable of developing skill to lead coach, to become a coach and travel. Some, sometimes they have to travel uh, to international. For example, I travel to China to develop esports curriculum. So this kind of um, expertise has also become popular among the students, especially the 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 the, spe the their special talent uh, will be able to let them provide suitable voices to teach uh, those uh, young gener young talent who are coming from their uh, amateur position to talk think about what they want to position themselves in the society. So in another category is the new jobs that I observe in the media sector. Right? So a lot of um, uh, players, they um, they have the expertise and then they develop their particular interesting broadcasting style. And then they also create their channels in YouTube and also Twitch to kind of share the particular kind of uh, broadcasting style that's humorous, that's funny, but at the same time, that's also very precise in making commentary. But this is also uh, in the very in starting age, starting stage that a lot of time the player will have to struggle in between of uh, making monetization from their career. So um, the category D is about how uh, players, when they are familiar with the PC bank culture, they'll be able to, um, main, to, to help the government, work as a government officer to, to, to implement the kind of uh, network relationship they have and then continue to help the government to, um, to manage fund, to allocate fund, to support different team and also support different kind of tournament um, that kind of continue to cultivate the particular kind of public, you know, esports uh, tournament and competition culture in South Korea. But this is also challenging because uh, um, the by kind of maintaining the esports policy uh, in the government office, a lot of time we have to talk about big budget and also high spending uh, for hosting the event. So um, the category E are those people that I find uh, as uh, emerging young talent who actually are participating in the amateur tournament. A lot of time they are, when they are really good, they have already have contract, you know, waiting for them after they graduate, right? But then a lot of time there's also this dilemma that they're facing, especially when they turn from amateur to become professional, that they start to, they will be starting to feel the stress of winning the game after they join the league. A lot of time, the life um, is about long hours of practice and also last time to see the family. I particularly find that the inner psychological state of this young talent require our attention, especially if they are at the very young age, but then they're also responsible for the success of the game corporation and also their sponsor. So here we are seeing in the case that there's this kind of a transformative process that we observe that blur the boundary between work and play. But then uh, we probably also, when we see the, the value chain in the making for South Korea, that we are seeing new job title uh, appearing by the effort for this uh, um, amateur and semi-professional uh, player. Probably we are also uh, responsible of thinking about more about this uh, meaning of the public sphere for a healthy ecosystem. Why? What are the issues that deserve our attention? And why? Why do this? How do we make these people continue to stay in the industry to develop further? So here that comes with uh, my idea about the importance of uh, higher education. So uh, especially we're in this post-pandemic society that there's this uh, growing acceptance about, you know, the very unique kind of uh, uh, digital environment that's very similar to esport competition. So what is the public model that we can go beyond the corporation to consider for creating a universe that's filled with higher possibility of long-term happiness and also satisfaction in the ecosystem?
So currently, in um, I'm arguing that there should be an all-inclusive framework um, that consider esport ecosystem merely uh, with a focus on sports. So now we are staying in this sports paradigm, but then um, there should be a uh, uh, value, some value to develop into other areas, for example, like in business and in merit conversion technology, in continuous uh, uh, professionalization training in the sports discipline, and particularly in the view of uh, humanity, I think player welfare, the health, Men, uh, mental well-being um, is particularly something that's important for people who are in the field of uh, humanity and social science study. So my conclusion is that there should be a kind of positive consideration for the positive development um, player power the, to kind of continue with this direction to, uh, to uh, overcome a lot of uh, stigma that's being uh, triggered by this this phenomena on play to assess, like you know, play is becoming more than what the society wants. So it's uh, um, the higher education can look into the area that set up a good relationship between self development and also the relationship of uh, power play to community and society. So this is my presentation, and I hope that um, it, uh, it will be. It's a. It's a helpful or informative sharing and I look forward to your feedback and conversation in the future. Thank you very much.